Some sites which connect to the Internet may want to restrict who can connect to their internal machines. For example, a university might wish to restrict who could access machines containing the grades of their students, or a company might want to restrict access to a machine with proprietary data on it. To provide this restriction, a site will implement a firewall or a combination of routers and hosts which will limit access to internal machines from the global Internet. Security within a firewall is implemented at two different levels, the network layer and the application layer. At the network layer, access is controlled between certain addresses or between TCP ports. For example, a site might allow all machines on the Internet to access an FTP server, but might only allow a few machines on the Internet to access a machine with confidential data on it. At the application level, a site might only allow Telnet and FTP through the firewall and deny use of all other applications. And then, only for a few users, with the outside world across the firewall. To implement access control at the network layer, a site will use a filtering router. The router is used to control connectivity between machines connected to the global Internet and machines connected to the site's internal network. This connectivity is controlled through use of access lists. A router access list specifies what hosts are permitted to communicate with each other. For example, an access list entry such as permit 130.100.1.3.129.127.8.1 would permit communication between the hosts 130.100.1.3 and 129.127.8.1. An entry of the form deny 130.100.1.4 might deny all connections to that machine. An entry of this form would deny all those people who want to access machine 5, which holds student grades, but permit everyone who wants to access machine 4 for email. Most sites, if they choose to implement a filtering router solution as part of their firewall, will have very complex access lists. It may affect your ability to debug connectivity problems since you won't always be able to fully check connectivity to a machine at the site. To implement access control at the application layer, a site will use a bastion host. This host will act as a relay for services between machines inside the company and the outside world. For example, to Telnet to an outside host, a user would connect to the Bastion host and then connect from that host to the outside machine. When users report a problem with an application layer service, such as email or Telnet, to or from a site, you may need to investigate whether or not that user's access is permitted by the remote host. In the event that the user is not allowed access, you will have to tell the user he is attempting something the remote computer of the school or company does not allow. However, you may need to contact the administrator of the Bastion host to report service troubles. So what now? A network operations center monitors a data network for problems that occur within the network. The NOC usually has some type of network monitoring system that queries all the nodes within a network to ensure that the network is still alive. Your job as a network operator includes monitoring the network for any problems, accepting a problem report via a hotline, and initiating repairs as needed. Once the repair is completed and verified, you will need to follow up with the user to make sure they are satisfied with the resolution. The most common problem you will see in a NOC is a data circuit problem. In wide area networks, Point-to-point -point telephone company circuits are used to tie together local networks so they can communicate with each other. The variety of problems you will see will range from some hardware in the circuit failing, a card going bad in a channel bank, or someone digging up a piece of fiber accidentally. In all cases, when you suspect a circuit problem, call the telephone company's repair number and tell them you have a suspected circuit problem. The more information you can give them in that initial call, the easier their job will be. For example, if you can tell them that you are seeing a red alarm, that will help them know where to start looking for problems. Throughout the outage, you will want to follow up periodically with the phone company to check their progress and to see if they have an estimated time to repair, or ETR, of the circuit. 
The estimated time to repair is important information you can pass along to customers. In order to understand a problem, it is important to know how circuits work in the first place. A circuit runs between a site and a provider's router. This circuit must be provided by the phone company, which runs a continuous path between the two endpoints. The connection may run over many different wires or across fiber or microwave and will have many different types of specialized hardware installed to make the circuit work. So what happens when things go wrong? The types of problems you will likely see on a circuit are varied and include channel service unit, data service unit errors, loops, and line errors. In order to send data across a phone company circuit, you must attach a special device to the circuit called a Channel Service Unit Data Service Unit, or CSU-DSU. The CSU-DSU is designed to hook to a user device. For example, in a wide area network, this would typically be a router and send the data to the phone company using specific methods of encoding. A CSU-DSU can report to you when a line is seeing errors or if the line is in an alarm state. Beware of the alarm state as it can indicate anything from a broken circuit to a report of where the circuit is broken. Thus, when you call the phone company, be sure to tell them, number one, if seeing an alarm, what type, number two, if seeing errors, what type, and how often the errors are occurring. A final thing you should check is the configuration of the CSU DSUs on each end of the circuit, particularly when the circuit stays up but sees errors on a consistent basis. Sometimes when certain options are set wrong on the CSU DSU, it can cause errors in the line. So be sure this is correct before asking the phone company to double check their findings. Of all the problems, the loop is the easiest to detect. Some routers will tell you if there is a loop on the circuit or line. Some routers do not indicate that the line is in a loop, so you will need to count the number of input and output packets on the serial line to see if a loop exists. For example, if the number of input and output packets are increasing at exactly the same rate, then it's likely there's a loop on the line. It's fairly unlikely that the number of input and output packets will increase at exactly the same rate unless the line is looped. Other problems involve finding a source of errors and then fixing it. For example, a line to a site will go down. If you look at the interface on the router, you will see that the error counters are increasing at a very fast rate. You may also look at the CSU-DSU hooked to the circuit and see an alarm indication or see error counters on the CSU-DSU increasing at a fast rate. Thus, you know that the circuit is having problems. You may also have to work with the phone company to isolate problems in circuits. If the phone company is having problems finding the particular spot at which a circuit is encountering errors, it may loop the circuit towards your router. By starting the looping at a point very close to your router and then moving the loops further out towards the remote site, you can find the exact location of the problem in the circuit. This enables the phone company to locate and fix errors. The ping utility is very useful to help in determining the location of a problem. Running pings with various options will allow you to look at how much time each ping takes and examine the high and low variances in the round trip times, or RTT. The RTT found at the bottom of the ping's response is a good monitor for checking stress on the circuit. In this example of a normal ping, all pings were returned and the variance in RTT is very small. This is telling you that things are pretty much operating within normal parameters. When you see a ping output like this, then you know from the high RTT that either there is a line or node congested somewhere in the path, or a circuit is possibly having problems. To confirm that a line is congested, follow each piece of the path to see where the problem is occurring. For example, suppose 131.187.45.1 is the node that the packet hits before going to 131.187.13.6. Try pinging that node. Now you know that either the line between 131.187.45.1 and 131.187.13.6 is full or is having problems. To isolate the problem further, you would need to look at the interfaces on the router and check for climbing error counters or look at how much traffic is flowing through the line.